All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NutraSearch and Douglas Laboratories educational webinar. Today's title is Natural Hormone Production, Part 2, Restoring the Production and Function of Endogenous Hormones, presented by Dr. Joseph J. Collins. My name is Christy Belalovic, and I am the Director of Product Development and Clinical Education for Douglas Laboratories, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. A reminder that this presentation will be recorded for viewing at a later date, and questions can be submitted anytime through the GoTo toolbar located on your screen. Now, Dr. Collins is an internationally recognized leader in the field of functional endocrinology. Dr. Collins is licensed by the state of Washington as a primary healthcare naturopathic physician, and he is the co-founder of Your Hormones Incorporated. With attention to highly personalized care, Dr. Collins' clinical protocols are available for healthcare professionals who use natural and integrative therapies. His customized therapies include a focus on functional medicine as a primary approach for support of menopause, andropause, PMS, adrenal health, and thyroid and blood sugar function. Dr. Collins is a clinical advisor, researcher, and developer of nine hormone-specific formulations available through Douglas Labs. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Collins. Thank you, Christy. Uh, it's, it's good to be back again to talk about part two. We're going to pretty much continue on what we discussed the first time. You know, it's, it, I know we call it part one and part two, but it's going to kind of flow together. The theme is going to be pretty much the same. The objective is we want to help people uh, be able to learn how to make their own hormones and, and make them work properly. So you, you know, so you and I may also phrase that restoring the production and function of endogenous hormones. We're basically saying the same thing, either with lay speak or with um, you know clinical speak. Um, one of the most important things that when I'm teaching patients and, and when we as clinicians are trying to help our patients understand our objective is. You know, especially in America, where BHRT hormone replacement therapy is so, you know, heavily marketed, is you know, it's not just the levels of the hormones; it's the function of them. A lot of people walk around with hormone levels quote in normal range. They may, um, you know, be in the low end of reference range, like the 30th percentile or 40th. But their feeling is that they're not working. And a big thing that realize, and as I mentioned last time, is you know, just as we can have insulin resistance, we can have estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid, and corticoid resistance. So one of the objectives that we talked about last time, and we'll touch on it again, is yes, we have herbs that have been documented to raise certain levels of specific hormones, um, like we can raise testosterone and we can raise thyroid hormone levels, et cetera. These have been documented in human studies. But more importantly than that is actually to improve the function of hormones. These are what we would call like agonist or mimetics and things that act like the hormone. We've used the word phytoestrogen for decades. Now maybe we'll talk about phytoprogestogens and phytothyrogens and phytoandrogens and whatever we're talking about here. We're trying to make hormones work better. And what's interesting is a lot of these are plants that are in our environment. And some of them are actually foods we talked about last time, foods that we eat that actually make, um, as that one example I gave, the thyroid hormone work better. So as we go through this now, uh, of course, there's the um, my contact information there again. You're going to find NutraSearch is going to be one of your most valuable resources there as far as helping you um, get the product and, do pro and understand the protocols because they have access. But if you have any questions that are new, um, run it by me as well. But I think you'll find the team to be very helpful and, and we're always dialoguing back and forth. Again, our, our goal here is to... The key concept that we talked about is botanical medicines to restore hormones, not just the hormone levels, but the actual function as well. So yes, we have hormones that can increase ACTH, LH, and FSH, or mimic TSH. We have, you know, they can mimic the hypothalamic pituitary, adrenal, gonadal, or thyroid axes, uh, and they can help prevent the um, gland atrophy that we have as time or stress go on with our lives. But by the same token, we also want to look at not just the hormone levels, but all the different regulatory systems that we talked about. You, you know, the stress response isn't just adrenal. I'm going to show you that graphic again. There's multiple systems involved, and we, plants that we traditionally call adaptogens throughout every culture are very appropriately termed that way because they help us adapt to stress. Hans Salier said the stress is a problem with adaptation. 
And when the word adaptogen was first applied, it was talked about these are plants that help us adapt to the change in our lives. So we're looking at adaptogens that have different specific qualities. And a big part of this has to do with, as I mentioned, cell signaling, which is getting to this, talking to the cells and getting them to respond more probably to hormones. You know, first time I, I remember sharing that phrase with someone about a decade and a half ago, and they were saying, oh, you mean like the cell phone? Yeah, like, can you hear me now? Like, why is this kind of like that? Yeah, you know, it's like the, the cells of the body are not hearing the hormones properly, and certain herbs can act as agonists. But then again, we may want some herbs that are antagonists because, you know, maybe we want to calm down excessive testosterone, et cetera. Again, in review, this is the steroid pathway. We've all seen many, many pictures of it. This is a modified one off of Wikipedia. I, I, I like to point out to people, again, that, you know, the primary hormones are estradiol and estrone. You know, there's lots of metabolites, but the making hormones, this is it. And also remember, the whole upper half of this is the adrenal glands. You know, so all of our progesterone in men comes from our adrenal glands. Most of the progesterone in women comes from adrenal glands. So these are important. Adrenal health is not just, what's this thing? Oh, cortisol. It's not just cortisol. The adrenal glands are involved with aldosterone, all these other um, progestogens and corticoids, etc. And the adrenal glands also make some of these androgens like DHEA, of course, and then the, the gonadal tissue can turn to testosterone, etc. In the thyroid in review, again, of course, we talked about T4 and T3. Remembering that T4 is so weak compared to T3 that a number of researchers have actually called it a pre-hormone or a pro-hormone because the T3 is the one that's most active at the cellular level at the DNA. And again, speaking of you know the cell and the DNA, that's in the lower right-hand corner here. That's one of the many of the regulatory systems that we are interacting with when we use herbal therapies, okay? Every time we give an herb, we're talking with these systems that communicate, you know? Remember the endocrine system, the skeletal system, the muscle system, that's hardware. It's just, you know, it's just tissue, okay? But what's actually matters to us is these regulatory systems. You know, I got a call from uh, one of your colleagues there in, um, in Australia, a, a naturopath, and he was telling me about the work he does, and he goes, you know, before I became a naturopath, I, I was a, um, a, an engineer involved with systems analysis. And I said, well, basically, you still are. You're still doing systems analysis, except now, instead of working with metal and plastic and silicon and all this other stuff, you're working with living systems, okay? So, you know, it's, um, he's still a systems analysis, and this is the type of work that he and all of us are doing. We're going to try to, what we're doing is we're balancing all these systems that are all affected by stress. You remember the first ones in me, like the adrenal glands, the adrenal cortex, the adrenal medulla, the renin angiotensin aldosterone systems. Those are the first three that you'll see up here. But then right behind that, you have all the other systems get involved with the stress response. And just as the different components of the adrenal gland can become exhausted, so can they. So part of our thing is to look at how we can restore the function of every system. And that's why when I mentioned, when I put adrenal men together, it was like, I'm not just interested in, you know, another adrenal herb, I'm, I'm interested in, am I actually interacting with every system that responds to stress? The neuroendocrine immune system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the cell signaling, um, the thyroid, et cetera, because when you're under stress, it's not just adrenal glands, the thyroid takes a big hit, you know, right after stress immediately, your thyroids can actually be a little bit, yeah, let's get in there and help with the fight, but boom, they're one of the first ones to get like, you know, exhausted under chronic stress. So sometimes people say, oh, the thyroid's really healthy and robust. Like in the early stage of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, when the antibodies are just starting, people go, well, look, T3 and T4 look fine. I'm going, yeah, we'll give it time, you know. And if you don't take care of that autoimmune disease, you can see a thyroid's going to get destroyed and burned out. So again, just like we have the different stages of stress that we talk about, you know, the alarm stage working all the way through to exhaustion, that can happen with any one of these systems. Uh, and we know that happens with the glucose system, for instance. You know, under stress, boom, your blood sugar rises up and you can get the sugar you need, but then after a while you wind up with dysglycemias and the whole thing goes on and on, you know. Okay, sorry, wrong slide, wrong button again. Okay. So again, that was talking about the generalized adaptation syndrome, and even though I list them, as a um, square, as you can see there, they, they, you know, 
Stress goes round and round where it stops, nobody knows. We're looking at all the different systems. And what we talked about last time real briefly was we talked about how, what if the hypogonal system goes out and you wind with low testosterone? Now, the other systems are great. They're going to be affected as well, I mean, but they're not. I didn't black them out. Keep that in mind. When your testosterone is low, your, your um, like, for instance, your neuroendocrine immune system is affected because part of the neuroendocrine immune system is the endocrine's right in the middle there. So every system is affected by stress, but the primary one in this case would be testosterone. People have low testosterone. And if you look at this, what you'll see again is even though the focus was on, yes, let's find herbs that, can, that have been shown to raise testosterone in human studies, uh, it's also important to recognize that these herbs are adaptogens, and you're going to recognize some of these herbs are used inside adrenaline and other formulations to help the body adapt to stress as well. And likewise, we also talked about, you know, if the hypogonal pituitary gonal system knocks out estradiol, in women you're going to have, you know, all the different symptoms. But what's the interest about, what's totally different about estrogen than any of the formulations I made is, I'm not using herbs to raise estradiol. Now, I will show you in herbs later on that I do use to raise estradiol, and I use that in test sequence for women. But we are not using herbs to raise estradiol in the in the menopause population because many of them are about risk factors because uh, of you know if I raise the estrogen am I going to put them at increased risk? And a large part of my population did have histories of breast cancers and uterine cancers, you know, endometriosis, all these other estrogen sensitive problems. So I want to get rid of the estrogen deficiency symptoms, and we're able to accomplish that quite well. But all these herbs have also been documented as having anti-proliferative. And remember, when I say anti-proliferative, that is a normal function that we all have. We, we have endogenous anti-proliferative systems. You know, the endocrine systems, the cytokine systems, different cell systems help control cell growth. And what we're doing is we're supporting those using herbs that mimic the endogenous, you know, check and balances that we have by design. So again, estrogen does not raise estradiol, but it is very effective in, in relieving all the symptoms from hot flashes to night sweats to vaginal dryness to sexual dysfunction to uh, dyscognia. Again, Bacopa and Centella, as you all know, very good for cognitive function, as Shazanda contributes to that, as does Salvia officinalis, also known as SAGE. So we already talked about you know, the, mo the big one, Adrenamen, and how it covers everything. Then we talked about the two big uh, hypogonadal um, pictures that can present either low testosterone, low estrogen. Now we're going to talk about some more of these formulations. And since we're building on part of what we already know, I'm not going to go over some of the same points as much, but, but keep those in mind is we're always treating everything at some point in time, okay? You know, like, um, for instance, if you look at low progesterone, I didn't just highlight, you know, the gonadal car, okay? I didn't just highlight the HPG. I highlighted the HP hyperlipopituitary adrenal cortex as well because as I've, we mentioned in the past and as you all are very much aware, the adrenal cortex does not only make cortisol. Now, I know we like to test cortisol and that's wonderful, it's exciting, but when you look at lab tests, you know, also look at the, the progesterone levels because you're gonna see that progesterone's reflection directly of adrenal function in the follicular phase, 60% of progesterone comes from the adrenal glands. So in the non-luteal phase in women, 60% is from the adrenal glands. And also we know DHEA, et cetera, also comes from the adrenal glands. Um, and then in men, 100% of our progesterone is from the adrenal glands. So a lot of times you, you may get these extensive panels that look at all the different hormones and metabolites, and you may look at that and I don't really care about the guy's progesterone. Well, yeah, you do. Look at that part of the, of the extensive um, hormone panel that you have that looks at progesterone, looks at progesterone metabolites, because that is directly telling you his adrenal function. I know we don't think of it that way, but that's what progesterone is trying to tell us. It says, hey, I'm off in the adrenal glands, and a man with low progesterone and low progesterone metabolites is, is basically validating the fact that he has problems with adrenal uh, exhaustion, if that's what that picture shows, or he has, or his adrenal glands are great, he's making plenty of progesterone, okay? And again, so when you have low progesterone, we talked about the fact that progesterone has specific actions. Every herb has specific actions. Uh, progesterone is catabolic, not as catabolic as cortisol. You know, you think of cortisol, you think of the synthetic, um, um, you know, prednisone that basically, you know, totally wastes away muscles. 
progesterone is catabolic and, and, and to the point that, you know, hormones that are catabolic not only break down protein, but they're also uh, proglycemic. They, they release blood sugar. So keep that in mind is that high progesterone levels can cause insulin resistance. You know, I was looking at, I like to see what's going on out there, and every once in a while I'd like to see the little chat rooms. I see people talking about, oh, you know, I'm taking a lot of progesterone, I'm putting out weight, my blood sugar's high, could, I have to, could it be the progesterone? And of course, the people that are marketing aggressively progesterone creams go, oh, no, progesterone has no side effects. Well, you and I know that's wrong. I mean, everything has side effects outside the normal reference range. High progesterone is a feeding. It causes eating behavior. That's why a woman that's carrying around a, a, a child and her abdomen is protruding, she still feels hungry because progesterone keeps that hunger drive going. And too much progesterone causes, you know, diabetes and insulin resistance and all those other things we talked about. But progesterone is wonderful because it's anti-proliferative. So it protects from the, um, you know, proliferative and the pro-cancer effects of estrogens. It's also wonderful because it's gobinergic. It, it's very calming and soothing, relaxing. You know, I remember years ago I met a, um, a well-known gentleman. I won't mention his name. And um, he goes, "Oh yeah, whenever I get a little stress, I just rub a little progesterone on my neck." You know, and I'm going, "That's like, you know, it's like self-medicating with Xanax." I mean, you know, high amounts of progesterone, you'll feel mellow, but I don't think progesterone is the best way to do that. You know, you, um, keep it within the range here. And progesterone is anti-inflammatory. When women go through um, menopause, if she has a menopause type that we've talked about again, and she has low progesterone symptoms, has low progesterone, she's going to have more aches and pains and allergy and inflammation, all those things that that um, you would expect when the anti-inflammatory properties are gone with that. So, and, that, and that's also why PMS can be so bad, because they use these nice high levels of PMS, they feel great when the progesterone's high, all of a sudden the progesterone plummets and everything hurts and the cramping and all the things that happen. Part of that's because it's, it's, the, it's the degree of the drop is how I'm trying to explain to patients, you know. Yes, I know you have nice progesterone levels during your luteal phase, but you should have nice levels during your follicular phase because follicular is the physiological baseline. That's the 60% from the adrenal glands plus the other 40% your ovaries are contributing. And if your follicular phase barely has any progesterone, then when you drop down from luteal to follicular, you're going to feel that crash and that's what PMS is. PMS is basically a, a, is a, is a follicular insufficiency of progesterone relative to the high amounts of, um, of luteal phase, you know, and they become real sensitized to the, whoa, I felt so good just last week, now I'm horrible because, you know, the body felt calmed down, now it's all agitated because no progesterone is there. And I think we've talked about the signs and symptoms of progesterone, um, you know, throughout the years, and, we, and again, you know, I know we talk about fatigue and stuff like that, but look at irritability and tension, anxiety, and just feeling anxious altogether. I mean, that's the nervous system being affected. Sleep apnea is fascinating because progesterone actually drives um, the depth of inspiration. It makes you take a deeper breath. So when women get low progesterone, that they don't breathe as deep, and they wind up with you know hypoventilating, and you know then the body kind of freaks out, and it takes a you know deep breath, and they kind of wake up, going, "Why am I feel like I'm suffocating?" Well, because your progesterone's so low, so low, you're hypoventilating, and you know, and then your body feels that low oxygen, high CO2, and it's kind of having an alarm reaction in the night, and you're taking deep breaths and waking up. So progesterone's very interesting as far as good sleep function as well. Um, we talked about aches and pains, inflammation, swelling, allergies. Again, that's progesterone's nature. It's calming. We don't have it. Those symptoms emerge. Cramping, uh, especially the premenstrual cramping, is because instead of the um, calming, you have, wow, it's flatlined down to the really low follicular phase progesterone levels, and they're going to feel that. Progesterone is gobinergic, so it does balance the brain where you don't have that. You know, the mind can't think clearly. There's a lot of mood swings in this. It's very exhausting through all of it. You have um, endometrial problems, breast problems, and um, again, progesterone metabolites are actually antiarrhythmic. You know, a recent paper was just talking about how they've seen, been able to identify in plants, like Digitalis purpurea, actually makes progesterone which is exciting, you know, plants making their own hormones, okay, and then it converts progesterone into digoxin, which if you look at the digoxin molecule, it looks like a progesterone metabolite, 
And other papers throughout the decades I've come across have talked about the antiarrhythmic properties of progesterone metabolites. So we have this built-in antiarrhythmic properties, and this is one reason why we see, you know, more palpitations as progesterone levels get low in the uh, perimenopausal woman. It's like the, you know, very fascinating. PMS, PMDD, there's a lot of papers and research on this, and what they do is they basically have this long laundry list of symptoms that pretty much sound like what we just talked about, but then we have other symptoms that have nothing to do with progesterone, and, you know, as we, you know, same way we talk about, like, low testosterone and low estrogen, etc., we recognize that there are different types of PMS. Again, Dr. Abraham recognized this in 1983. He did, in the paper, mention PMS A, that group did have low progesterone, and he mentioned PMS D, cluster of symptom patients had low estrogens, and the type C with cravings, he didn't actually mention low androgens, but that's one of the things that we now recognize that with dysglycemia, low, these are like low testosterone symptoms in a way as well, especially like, you know, um, so this is, again, we're not talking about dysprogesterone, we'll talk about other ones here, and then um, high testosterone people they wind up with uh, a high aldosterone-like symptoms, et cetera. But this is what you would do here. The patient that comes into you, and you look at a cluster of symptoms, and you see a lot of this going on here, you know, palpitations, and we just talked about that, the tension, the cramps, the, the discomfort, and the agitation. Um, those aren't only progesterone, as I mentioned, because low testosterone can cause it. But probably is looking at what the specific needs of each patient are. And then the goal was, okay, how am I going to create what I want if a patient doesn't have progesterone? And the objective at this point in time was I, I practiced herbalism for quite a number of years. I mean, I started like as a lay herbalist way back in my youth and, and studied herbs out in the field and, you know, growing them and grinding them, making tinctures and teas and all that those years. And, and then eventually, um, you know, did a lot of tinctures in my practice and then, and then eventually started going towards some of the uh, capsules because I find out that I can get, I can get standardized. You know, one of the things is, as you know, as I've known for myself, when you grow herbs, you they can you can actually taste differences based upon from year to year because you may have had different amounts of sun or heat or whatever. And if herbs are not, some herbs need to be stressed in order to get the active constituent to come out. The best example we can all probably know is culinary herbs. If you overwater your the rosemary and the sage, they don't get the nice sharp essential oils as if you let them dry and get a little bit stressed because that pushes out the essential oils more. So I like the standardized ones because it makes sure that from year to year we have the consistency of the um, active constituent that we want. So if you read the fine print and all the labels, you'll see standardized to this, standardized to that. And that's the interesting point that someone brought up is, is what's the, why do I like the capsules is, number one is I get the standardization from year to year. And number two, I got a little more better compliance when I start to use capsules because you know, people are excited about that, you know, little shot of tincture and making the tea for a while, but that gets old real quick, especially when people, you know, that's not part of their, their, their lifestyle. I mean, you know, if you grow up with herbal medicine, that's one thing, but a lot of people, they haven't grown up making tinctures and drinking teas like many of us have, so it's always get much better to be a compliance by getting them to the capsules. But I looked at some of the properties of herbs, and I said, I wanted herbs that, first of all, are going to help the adrenal glands make progesterone, and also one ones that, that really act like progesterone. They've been documented anti-proliferative and all the things that progesterone does, I put that in like I like to call it my little wish list of what I want inside here. You know, and as many of you may recall from last week, what I wound up with is I, I come up with formulations that will actually have references that say, yes, this does that. Now in progesterone, what you're going to see here is the second line is actually the herbs that are progesterogenogenic. Um, what that means is like Colvis for Scoli, Vuplam for Cardam, and Romania, each of those have been documented in human studies and I've used these in different forms to actually raise endogenous production of progesterone. Now those three work by the adrenal gland, okay, the literature will tell you that they'll increase adrenal production of, of progesterone in humans, etc. And uh, Peony lactifloria, it also works very strongly on the uh, ovarian tissue. So obviously if you have um, the um, PMS woman, the younger woman, and part of her problem is her ovaries are not contributing their 40%, which is why her follicular progesterone is, is you know, bottoming out and she's having PMS, the pionolactifloria can contribute to that. Yes, pionolactifloria has other properties you're going to see 
and some of the other formulations, but one of them is progesterogenic. All of the herbs except for one so far, we've been able to find documentation that they're anti-proliferative. Looking at how the gusticum works and some of its other properties, I suspect it's also anti-proliferative, but I'd like to wait until I can find a paper before I put a checkbox inside here. So, you know, you may go to my website in a, you know, a few weeks to months and see that that is a checkmark on it, and that will mean that we now in our databases have references that actually describe it as having anti-proliferative properties. Um, it's important to have bone support, so these have been documented improved sex function. That's important too because one of the problems with progesterone is, is these people self-medicate like they do in America and they buy these progesterone creams and they're slavering it on. It's a strong gobinergic, but too much progesterone is actually an anti-aphrodisiac. I mean, you take male sex offenders and they inject them with synthetic progesterogens to control, you know, deviant, you know, control problems, you know, um, with them. So progesterone can suppress sexual function if it gets too high. So yeah, I want to make progesterone. First of all, the body has this check and balance system. We're not going to wind up with hyper progesterone is infused in herbs. I've never seen that documented with any of these herbs. Uh, but at the same time, it's nice to see that we're also going to improve sexual function. Blood sugar control is important because again, self medicate progesterone as a replacement causes blood sugar disorders, whereas these herbs actually, many of you use some of these herbs to help with blood sugar disorders. A um, number of them have been documents antioxidant, nootrophic protection of the memory. That's very important as well. Cognitive function is a big concern with almost all the patients that come in, whether it be estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. So fortunately, many of the herbs that the different cultures around the world have chosen is because they feel better, not just physically, but people notice that their minds are clearer, et cetera. So we find these herbs have been documented having you know, nootropic or neuroprotective properties. Um, cardioprotective, gobinergic, we would expect that. Of interest, only two of these have actually documented to have been independently documented having gobinergic properties in of themselves. Now, the other ones that will raise progesterone, of course, will raise progesterone, which contributes to gobinergic, but two of the herbs have been documented as purely having gobinergic properties independent of the progesterone. And just as test, uh, progesterone is angiolytic, these herbs, most of them are angiolytic. They've all been, uh, all been designated as having anti-inflammatory properties, some of them quite robustly. Um, you know, like I used to use Ruplan Romani quite a bit in combination, even like with autoimmune diseases to calm down inflammation. And all of them have been documented to contribute to analgesic um, properties, which again, which is what we want from progesterone. So this is a formulation that increases endogenous progesterone and helps progesterone work better. It does both. Increase production and function. It's used by women that say, I don't want to start on progesterone replacement therapy right away, but I want to help my body make its own. Uh, some women that are on progesterone replacement therapy are still having symptoms. Uh, in the old days, would give them more than they wind up with insulin resistance. Now we're saying, whoa, you know, you don't need more hormones. You need the cells to listen. It's about the listening, the self receptor function, and progesterone cleans that up. It also helps re prevent the side effects of taking too much progesterone. Uh, again, because I said too much progesterone can uh, cause blood sugar disorders, suppress libido, etc. Uh, women are taking this here to get off of progesterone. And this is one of those things that is really helping a lot with women getting off of birth control pills. A lot of women at this stage in lives now, they want to get off of birth control pills and they come off of them and a lot, they become very miserable because their bodies are used to having these synthetic progestogens with the synthetic estrogens. And they'll start them on at least progestamine. Some will start progestamine and estramin. And when they come off of the birth control, they'll start before they come off. And then when they wean off their birth control pills, they don't have that tremendous crash like a lot of women are having before we realize that. Before we, you know, pull away the, you know, synthetic replacement, let's kind of rebuild up the endogenous production. And um, that's been, it's been wonderful for that. And of course, it's wonderful for PMS. But I, I think that the birth control pill is what. It's getting real popular for now here in the States. Um, as I mentioned last time, in the 90s, I was going after the one-size-fits-all because it was pretty much a global phenomenon where they're using prescriptions or herbs. It was like menopause was treated one way, you know, we had the menopause pill, and I just and I recognized the different menopause types. And as I mentioned last week, when I first started doing this in the, or 93, you know, you couldn't even measure testosterone in women. You had to argue with the labs because they were used to measuring testosterone in women. Well, thank God we've come a long way now. It's no longer 1993, so now we're measuring testosterone in women, and we realize some even have too much. 
But look, if you look at this, over half of the menopause types from 7 all the way through 12 could use progesterone. So progesterone deficiency uh, or insufficiency or poor function is, is very common in, in, um, in menopause. Not everyone has it, but when they do, it makes a difference to have this. And as you've also, similar to what we mentioned last week, there's um, different forms of PMS and PMDD. Again, premenstrual syndrome, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is like, you know, really bad PMS. And quite a bit of this does have to do with low progesterone. Progesterone is very calming and soothing, anti-inflammatory, and all those things. When those are gone, people are miserable. I think one of the most profound cases I had a number of years ago, a woman, she had... Um, severe PMDD to the point where she was incapacitated in bed for, you know, three days every month and, you know, she had all these, okay, my periods, a lot of cramping and pain before and during uh, her, her, you know, f the first few days of her cycle. And uh, we put her on progestamine and she was doing great, but the third month of follow-up, she comes inside, I mean, I've shared this with you all before, and she had like this real stern look on her face and I was going, uh-oh, something's going on here. And uh, I said, what's going on? She goes, well, you know, I um, had an accident. I go, oh, are you okay? I thought she had a car accident. And she goes, I go, what happened? She goes, I had a period. I go, well, that's wonderful. She goes, I didn't know it was coming. So what happened is she used to have so much suffering and pain before her cycle that she kind of knew it was coming and she got ready. Well, all of a sudden one day she just starts bleeding without the symptoms, you know. And that's what happened to her PMS. It went away. And so she says, well, what do I do now? And I go, oh, get a calendar, you know. And what else can you do? So um, so now, she, and, and to this day, I follow up with her, and she does great. She tries to wean off, and she finds out that if she stays, you know, two progesterone a day, um, and at one point in time, she's doing good on one a day, but now she's getting a little older, so um, she's able to not have PMS. So it's really exciting that, you know, we can help people make their own progesterone and, and get rid of those horrible monthly symptoms that had caused her so much of a poor quality of life for so long. And also the PCOS and PCO-like syndrome, um, again, not only do these women have a predisposition towards high testosterone, uh, many of them also have low estrogens and quite a few of them also have low progesterone. So that may be part of the picture is to, you know, use a formulation to control the testosterone and, and maybe uh, the estrogen, but most of them do need the progesterone support as well. And um, you see that protocol there. Uh, the HPT axis is another axis that may go wrong, the high-flying pituitary thyroid. And, of course, that can be because of secondary things going on because of global stress or multiple system fatigue or can be just, you know, uh, primary um, hypothyroidism is that the, the gland itself is, is not working because it's been destroyed, as in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, you know, so it's no longer making T4 and T3. Sometimes under severe stress, like people with chronic illnesses, you deal with people that have um, chronic autoimmune diseases like sojourns, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic cardiac disease, chronic pulmonary diseases. Many of these people make too much reverse T3. It's part of the, the stress response. The body's always in overdrive. They're, they're chronically ill, and they make too much reverse T3. And as you know, reverse T3 binds to the... Uh, cell receptor and it doesn't let T3 in, so it's like the anti-thyroid hormone, and so they wind up with, you know, um, cellular hypothyroidism, even though the T3 and T4 may be normal. So, you know, um, part of the picture is we need to turn that around as well. Now, when you look at the whole concept of the thyroid hormones, one of the things I've noticed is that the list of symptoms that are associated with low thyroid function it's like almost everything you could think of, okay? Everywhere from all the fatigue disorders to feeling aches and pains to cold, uh, hands, cold feet, you're feeling puffy skin, you're bloated, uh, on, on, on. It's like everything, in, you know, I think even global warming now is being blamed on low thyroid function at one point. It's, the problem is it, it, it's because when you have low thyroid, like everything feels it. It's like the entire system is the metabolic rate being shut down, so you're going to have secondary hypogonadism, okay? Every time you have low thyroid, you're always going to have secondary low testosterone, all these other symptoms as well, so that's part of the picture. So when, I'm, when someone comes in with clinical pictures, I, I look for the thyroid picture, but what really helps to, with the determination of that is what are the risk factors involved? You know, should I be chasing after the thyroid symptoms or should I go after the you know, the global um, adrenal fatigue, the multiple system fatigue, or should I go after the testosterone problems that um, the men are feeling, or maybe it's the progesterone in women or estrogen? 
what helps me in part of making this decision clinically, even if I have lab tests, is I look at history. And if the person has a personal history or a family history of autoimmune disease, uh, or if they have any personal history of thyroid disease ever, then it's most likely their thyroid, okay? You know, if I have women say, oh, I once had thyroid problems during my first pregnancy, they'll tell me, and I go, well, then that means that at one point in your life, you're going to wind up hypothyroid. All the literature shows that, you know, yes, that may have been a temporary, but it always comes back when you start to get middle aged. I mean, paper after paper, unless we intervene and, and support the system, because once the thyroid system is insulted at that level, then it may um, come back and um, haunt you again. And we've seen that time and time again. Certain drugs like high doses on prescription lithium and amiodarone universally will knock out the thyroid. I'm, I should say almost universally. I, I've, I've really seen a case where people on those long-term didn't have thyroid problems. If they've ever smoked tobacco, some people are sensitive to too much iodine. You know, I mean, you know, we have certain dosages, but there's some people if they if they take too much all of a sudden, then you know it can be too much of them. Especially if they have like low selenium. You know, people, we look at the balance of them all. So that's why a good broad spectrum nutrient is going to also give them selenium, so that when they have the iodine, as well, iodine can you know stimulate the thyroid function. But the problem is is that um, you need the selenium to help control the the oxidative stress that happens with the the consequence of increased iodine. And if people just take an iodine, they're not balancing with the you know, molybdenum and selenium, they get other problems. And then we look at, you know, do they, um, you know, do they have iodine in their diet at all? Are they eating any seafood or other foods that have that? Are they eating too much of the cabbage, cough, or broccoli, Brussels sprouts, etc.? I know it's important to eat those foods, you know. And yes, I'm telling my patients to decrease risk of breast cancer. Eat the cruciferous family, you know, in moderation, a couple of servings a week, and also get your B12 to methylate. But what's important here is not is the extreme cases. There was a, there's a documented case of a woman who um, ate um, five kilograms, which is like 10 pounds of um, Chinese cabbage a day, because someone told her it would cure her um, rheumatoid arthritis, and she wound up in a mixed edema coma. It actually shut down her thyroid. So that's the only case I found where cabbage the cruciferous family knocks out the thyroid, and it took um, 10 pounds for. I think it was about two weeks, I believe. So you know, I'm not. A, so it's okay to eat it. Just don't go extreme and eat like 10 pounds a day, which I think there's something else going on. If someone's going to eat that much cabbage anyway, sort of anxiety disorder. Family history. If your parents have it, family has it. You know that increased my risks. And if a family's ever had thyroid, so that's part of it. I look at all the symptoms, and if I see family history, I go, well, then because your family history, yes, I'm going to start looking look at giving you thyroid because um. You have such a strong family history, but otherwise, all those symptoms could be like a, a multiple system fatigue disorder. They could be low testosterone, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how, how I do it. I look at family history as well. Women that have um, severe PMS and PMDD and PCOS have high incidence of thyroid. And, and a couple of papers came out recently again, pointing out the high incidence of comorbidity between PCOS and thyroid. Uh, women with severe mental disorders, they often see thyroid. Uh, Any time a woman's pregnant, it increases her chance of having low thyroid function by 12% in her lifetime. So, you know, if a woman's had five children, then she has like a 60% chance of having thyroid disease in her lifetime. Uh, that was an interesting paper. Uh, ever had a miscarriage, and every time, oh, after the age of 40, the papers show that the statistical incidence rises of thyroidism in men with erectile dysfunction and men with gynecomastia in large breasts, men over the age of 50. Those are things that make me say, well, your symptoms could be something else, but because of all these symptoms and all these risk factors, we're going to go with statin and thyroid right away. So the objective here was to try to say, how are we going to get the thyroid to work now? The thing about thyroid hormones is, is it's much more than just iodine. Giving iodine is the easy part, you know. And as I studied about the process about how the body makes thyroid hormones, I'm going, okay, that's interesting. And then, like, how the thyroid hormones actually work, it was more complicated than, you know, um, you, you'd come to imagine. So I have a list of them here, but I'm actually going to show them to you in a graphic here. The first step is easy. Provide iodine, okay? There's a lot of good um, ways to get iodine out there. I chose two specific seaweeds because they have, like, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant properties as well, et cetera. And uh, some of the other seaweeds that were optional, actually, one of them was actually pro-inflammatory, so I, providing iodine was the first step. It doesn't matter how much iodine you have in your blood, though, or in your urine, or anywhere, 
What matters is how much iodine gets inside the thyroid cell. Now, there's about 348 papers in PubMed that use the phrase thyroid hormone resistance now. And what they're talking about is there's different places where the thyroid doesn't work properly, and some of them talk about dysfunction of the sodium iodide supporter protein. So get, getting iodine in the blood is not enough. We need to get the iodine inside the thyrocyte, inside the thyroid cell. And we, don't, we need to activate the sodium iodide supporter protein and then the whole process of stimulating um, thyroglobulin production and, and actually um, having the, um, it, it to be dumped into the follicular collo uh, um, colloid area between the follicles and to get conjugated to iodine and on and on and on, all those steps to finally come out with actually creating T3 and T4. That's the whole process inside of itself of what the thyroid gland does. That's the machinery going on there, okay? But the next steps beyond that is once the thyroid hormone is out inside the blood, I'm waiting for your picture come there. Once you have the um, thyroid hormone out in the blood there, you're going to see that there's a picture of like a kidney, and the kidney has like type 1 deiodinases, and then you have other tissues that can have type 2 and type 3. And the problem is, is that if you don't convert T4 to T3, then you're not going to get the full thyroid function. So the fourth step of making this all happen is the uh, ability of the is that working? I'm not showing on your slide there. Okay, is the ability of the thyroid to actually make um is the ability of T4 to get converted to T3? Excuse me. If you don't make T3, you're going to make reverse T3, which is the antithyroid hormone. Okay. And the next step after that is even if we get the thyroid hormone out into the blood and I'll convert to T3. This is where a lot of resistance takes place, is getting the thyroid receptor to function properly, to get the receptors. The receptor for the thyroid you know, is actually two different proteins that come together, the RXR and the TR. Now, to think of the significance of that, if you look at estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone receptors, those two proteins are identical, and they come together as a pair. Okay, it's a homodimer, same pair, same dimer, okay? Um, thyroid is a heterodimer, meaning two different proteins come together to let the thyroid connect and communicate with the DNA. So what that means is you have a more complex receptor function, and you can have receptor resistance going on here, and that's what they're talking about is part of the receptor resistance. Even after you get the receptors functioning, it has to bind to the DNA, and there's certain um, coactivators and, and other factors involved in making that happen, and then even after that, the next step is is the thyroid hormone actually stimulating the, the RNA to tell the cell to do what it's supposed to do? You know, as I said at the beginning of last thing, many times I'm talking with patients, I'll look them in the eye and I say, you know, hormones don't do anything. And then they'll kind of stare at me like, oh, God, I picked the wrong doc, you know. And I remind them, I say, all hormones are as messengers. They have to go to the cell and tell that cell to make a neurotransmitter or a protein or whatever it's supposed to do. So that's what this whole thing is about, is getting the thyroid message all the way through, but also making sure that the, that the tissues response. Because without tissue response, the thyroid hormone levels are, are not enough. It, 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 this is what we, many of us use, like to face um, clinical hypothyroidism, because that's what we're seeing. People have, quote, normal thyroid levels, but they're miserable because they have thyroid hormone resistance. So uh, in, in looking through the literature, I said, okay, let me find, let me accomplish this. And through the years, I found different herbs that help, and, and the different ones that had literature to back them up. And we have two herbs here that provide iodine, and they're also anti-inflammatory. Um, two herbs that actually been documented to increase iodine uptake by the thyroid cells. They actually stimulate sodium iodide supporter protein. That's coleus for scoli and humulus. Without those the iodine does not get into the thyroid cell if you have sodium iodide supporter protein problems. And according to research, a lot of people have sodium iodide supporter protein problems. So this is why we're seeing people going, um, you know, why isn't my iodine working? It's because you need uh, colis and humus. That's just to get to step two, okay? Now step three is we need to tell that hardware inside the thyroid cell to get to work the machinery and actually produce the thyroid hormone. And I think we're all familiar with the research that how Bacopa and Coleus and Withania help with uh, you know, organification of iodine. Basically, they attach the iodine to the organic um, thyroid globin molecule. Um, you know, how Coleus actually promotes thyroid globin production, causes iodine 
organification and causes the T3T4 production and then the exocytosis of the T3T4 into the bloodstream. So all that's happening with these herbs. And then the conversion of T4, T3, it took a little more to get that to the level I wanted to. Some of these herbs helped to some degree, but we had to add a little bit more. And then finally, when I added uh, some Comiform call that was able to assist the other herbs in actually seeing more T4 to T3 conversion. And more importantly, a dropping of the reverse T3. I think a newsletter I sent out a while back, it's on my archives, shows a woman that she had quite robust reverse T3 and she uh, was struggling with morbid obesity and after you put in thiamine, all of a sudden her reverse T3 just like plummeted down and which, which means that all of a sudden her T3, the reverse T3 ratio improved dramatically and all of a sudden she's like losing weight. It's like, um, and sweating. Unfortunately, she started to all of a sudden create um, uh, thermogenesis, so we had to teach her about what it feels like to have a body that now sweats and is hot. So um, that helped with that. Now the next thing beyond that is, um, sorry, that slide just peaked on a second there. Uh, thyroid hormone receptor uh, function of interest, it was rosemary and sage. The only herbs at that time I was able to document that actually increased um, RxRTI heterodimetrization are the ones that were in my kitchen shelf. So that reminded me about how years ago when whenever my friend would come over from my mom's Italian spaghetti, he'd get all sweaty and stuff, even though we didn't use hot Italian sausage. It was because apparently little Freddie had some type of thyroid um, uh, receptor resistance, and whenever he had rosemary and sage, he got a little warmer. So if you see someone get hot after eating rosemary and sage, that means that, oh, you've just opened up the thyroid receptors. A number of four of the plants have been documented at that point in time to actually increase binding to the DNA. It's nice it's inside the cell. Now it actually has to bind to the DNA and do this, and then it has to increase the actual cellular response to messenger RNA. All these checks and balances are important because one of the risks of having un, without having all these different steps is, you know, hyperthyroidism is extremely dangerous. You know, the, you know, we've seen what can happen with Graves' disease out of control, the hyperthermia, the tachycardia, the neurological symptoms, the hypertension, all these things. So, the, you know, the body has these checks and balances, but when these checks and balances get in the way and they don't, and we have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Stel, and we have subclinical hypothyroidism and 348 papers about thyroid hormone resistance. That's what thyroid is designed to address. So the people that are using thyroid are patients that they don't want to take thyroid replacement therapy, but they have low thyroid symptoms. You know, if a patient has low thyroid symptoms and they don't have anti-T3, anti-T4 antibodies, then there's no real, then I'm saying, you know, why would we give you thyroid replacement? Your thyroid is not destroyed. I don't know how many people have taken, uh, I, I actually don't because I quit counting, how many people have taken off a thyroid replacement because someone said, oh, your thyroid hormones are low, let me give you some. So here, take it. I'm saying, well, why don't you just make it? Let's make hormones instead. So we, we get them, to, they don't have antibodies, the thyroid is not destroyed. You put them in thyroid, they actually can start making their own T3, T4 again. But then again, you have those patients, let's be honest, they come to us, it's too late. The thyroid is basically a lump of scar tissue. Like I was talking with the endocrinologist saying about, you know, that's that's a reality. Sometimes it's too late. The thyroid has been destroyed. It's all sclerotic and scar tissue. But then the patients are on thyroid medication and it's still not working properly. Well, those are the other steps in the process, you know, you know, getting the thyroid hormone into the cell of the body, getting to respond to resistance. So even thyroid replacement, even T, given T3 and T4 does not guarantee that the thyroid hormone is going to work. If your patient's on proper amounts of T3 and T4 and the lab tests come back and say, oh, you have enough hormones, I'm not going to push into hyperthyroid and put, you know, and cause problems, then you say, okay, it's not the hormone levels, it's just it's tissue response, thiamine helps with that. And again, a number of people were weaned off a thyroid replacement that really didn't need it because they, thi they, they were just hypothyroid function and we're able to re re reactivate, restore hormone function with thiamine. It's been pretty exciting, this formulation, um, getting the right combination, and it works fantastic. Uh, you know, these protocols will be available for me if you're new to search in, in Douglas Labs. I have them posted on their website as well, and periodically they'll be updated, so every once in a while you'll see they'll be changing, like, um, like this one was actually changed because I want to make some specifics on it. For instance, um, this is the, uh, the most recent version here. So first of all, for thyroid health, obviously, you can give thiamine, but if a person has anti-TG antibodies, thyroid globulin means that the thyroid guts are spilling out, okay? The thyroid cells have been destroyed. It actually stands thyroid globulin, but I tell patients TG, they remember that. 
and uh, Wobenzyme has been shown to actually reverse anti-TG antibodies. This giant paper I found, never look, trust me, okay? But on the other hand, we know that if they all, only have anti-TPO, anti-thiol peroxidase, that means that the cells are peeved, the PO, they're irritated, okay? The thyroid cells are irritated and they're leaking. Irritated thyrocytes will leak thyroid peroxidase enzyme and cause elevations of anti-TPO antibodies, but the thyroid is not destroyed. The thyrocytes are not being destroyed till we see anti-TG. So if we're lucky enough, like I see some people real early and they only have anti-TPO, I give them slamethionine and boom, that comes down and there's countless papers I've been saying this for years, this is nothing new. But that's the difference between um, how to get rid of one versus the other antibody. Obviously, if they have too much estrogen, that can you know, estrogen can antagonize thyroid. You can use estroquench. If the patient not only has the thyroid picture, but they're also presenting with multiple system fatigue that we talked about, then we can use adrenamine. You know, yes, they have the strong thyroid picture, but you're going, you know, you also showing signs like the different components of your adrenal gland, like your adrenal cortex, your adrenal medulla, your your, your aldosterone, your retaining fluid. Yes, that can be thyroid, but some of the other symptoms makes you think it's multiple system. Quite a few patients, the, the go-to formula, the go-to combination is thiamine and adrenamine. I've had many people on, you know, calorie-restricted diets. They're down to like, you know, less than a thousand uh, calories a day. Um, how they measure in America, and um, and you know, they were losing weight. Now they're not, you know, and they want to cut down more and more. And some, I had one lady down to like 500 calories a day, and she like plateaued. And I'm going, you can't get any lower than that. You need at least one gram per kilogram of pro one gram of protein, etc. So I put her on thiamine and adrenamine, and, and it broke her out of that stasis, out of that plateau, and boom. So that's been pretty cool to be able to see those two. Uh, the body adapts even to dieting. It tries to slow down the system, but if we use thiamine and adrenamine together, we can help the body say, you don't have to adapt that much. Let's lose some weight, and that works, okay? Um, I, I, I have anything to complete on this one, but actually you're going to find all the nutrients you need, and um, um, Nutrisearch has UP10. Uh, that's the formulation that's not available at, over there. Um, so estrogen dominance, let's talk a little bit about that. The reason I want to talk about that is because, you know, many systems are involved here. Yes, it's gonadal, but it, it's like, you know, some of the estrogen dominance could be because of adrenal stress is causing too much DHA that's also causing too much estrogen. The cell signal gets involved. It affects appetite. There's, a lot of systems are involved. Uh, the liver is directly involved, if not directly, then indirectly. So the whole system is like, you know, you know, code red, a little bit alert here, so uh, it can be quite a bit of problems here. Looking at this big picture here, in the middle you see that little black um, diagram there? That's testosterone, okay? All these big molecules all around it is aromatase. That's the enzyme that is going to turn testosterone into estrogen, okay? It does not stand a chance, okay? Once that little molecule gets grabbed by aromatase, it gets twisted and turned into estradiol. And that's what aromatase is supposed to do. Aromatase is required to turn androgens to estrogens. Now, we need to be clear about something. Is, is Estrogen is not a bad hormone. I'm not against estrogen. You know, I, I just want to make sure that if we do have too much, we can control it. You know, as I was talking with an endocrinologist today, we, we were discussing, um, you know, comparing notes and papers and research. And it reminded me of a, of a paper that came out a, a couple years ago about a, a study in which they gave men testosterone replacement therapy only, and they gave men testosterone replacement therapy and, and really strong aromatase inhibitors where they basically flatlined out their estrogens. What they found out is those men that had no estrogens had a high and start to develop osteoporosis, okay? So you don't want to have no estrogen. You just don't want to have so much estrogen that's going to cause problems, okay? The whole concept of estrogen dominance was a really big phrase over here in the 90s and the aughts, and it was used to heavily market progesterone, but the reality is True estrogen dominance means too much estrogen. The first time that word was used in men was in 1981, in which they recognized that a man with a, a testicular neoplasm actually had um, low testosterone but high estrogen. So the the uh, testicular cancer was actually pumping out estrogen instead of testosterone. And in men, when we have a low TD ratio, when our testosterone is getting low, but estrogen is getting higher, we get in trouble. What I tell men is. Um, Think of like the 40-20, okay? Over the age of 40, men are at higher risk for estrogen dominance and over 20 pounds. 
Okay, now in America, that's like everyone. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> There's a big problem that with that here because all it takes is a man to have 20 pounds of excess adipose tissue, and that 20 pounds becomes an estrogen-making machine. Okay, so these are the gentlemen that were saying, you know, you know, you look at estroquence to calm down the excessive conversion of your testosterone to estrogens. You know, I saw a man recently who was um he contacted me because someone else had given him testosterone replacement therapy which I wouldn't have done because he already had a high T, he had a low TD ratio, he already had plenty of estrogen and low testosterone, they gave him testosterone, his estrogen became twice of what a woman would want. And so obviously we're trying now to clean that mess up. So the concept here is is preventing testosterone from being converted to estrogen in men, they wind up with gynecomastia, the male breast, infertility. It's funny, low et no estrogen will cause infertility, too much estrogen will cause infertility. Depression, you knock out estrogen, too much estrogen is going to cause neurocognitive dysfunction in men. Men are going to become insulin resistant and diabetic with high estrogen and of course sexual dysfunction. The first time um, estrogen dominance was used in women was in 1986 in which a female patient had a desmoid tumor that caused too much estrogen to be produced and not enough progesterone. Again, so you know, the thing isn't always, you know, estrogen dominance truly means in, um, you need to control the excess of estrogen production in some cases, and that doesn't necessarily mean a progesterone deficiency. And the reason I'm saying that is because some people think the estrogen dominance, especially that when that 90s and aughts here in America, it was used to market uh, progesterone cream. If you have low progesterone, give low, then, then call what it is. It's not estrogen dominance, it's progesterone deficiency. So let's, you know, I hope you guys aren't having the same problem over this we are here. Over here, they're calling, you know, progesterone deficiency, they're calling estrogen dominance. It's not. It's progesterone deficiency. Then give progesterone men. But if you have too much estrogen, give um, estroquench, which we'll talk about here. The low PD ratio with women that make too much estrogen, fibrocystic breast disease, and the mutiosis, ovarian cancer, the desmoid tumor that we just talked about, uh, breast problems, all types of menopause problems, and PMS problems. So... You know, too much estrogen can be very dangerous on both the male and the female body. Now, what was interesting is I was researching this whole concept of aromatase inhibitors and recognizing that, you know, the pharmaceutical industry seemed to have a corner in the market. And, and then, you know, years ago, we didn't have the research we have now. I mean, now we've got some great research on aromatase inhibitors. But I also found out something quite fascinating is that we make our own aromatase inhibitors. You know, so this long list of words with lots of letters and numbers on them, these are actually molecules that your body makes, you know, to control the testosterone from being converted to estrogen. You know, so, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to help the body do what it wants to do anyway. It wants to keep a check and balance system the way it was designed. So I put my goals together and said, of course, I want something that will actually inhibit aromatase because that's what we want. And it has to be anti-proliferative as well. And all the list of my little wish list of what I want to do when I said, let's, we finally had enough research about plants and about human studies that have actually shown to have aromatase inhibition properties. Now, some of these papers are literally only a few years old. I mean, it was like forever waiting to get enough because I was never satisfied with a few of these herbs. When I finally start to get in the other herbs, I go, wow, this is it. So all the herbs at the top that have an X mark are aromatase inhibitors. Not all these herbs are aromatase inhibitors. But these ones are, I put the aromatase at the top. Now some of them, most of them have been documented so far to have anti-proliferative. Well, that's important because if someone has too much estrogen, the first thing you worry about is increased risk for cancer, proliferation. And so I'm going to go back behind, behind that and first of all, give them herbs that also help with the anti-proliferative. And they also cause apoptosis, program cell death. If the estrogen was causing you know, too much, quote, immortal cells, precancer cells. You want to take care of that. Protect the breast and prostate. Don't knock out sexual function just because you're knocking out estrogen. I mean, these herbs actually, um, some of these you're actually going to notice are used in um, test to gain as well because they can actually help, you know, uh, as this one's showing, make um, increased testosterone. Some of these do right here. Um, we want to control cortisol. Uh, this herb is fascinating. It tells the body to make testosterone. And then it says, just don't turn it into estrogen. I really like that, okay? These two herbs actually tell the, bar, the adrenal gland, make DHEA, but you're not allowed to turn it to estrogen. So it's pretty exciting to see these. Uh, Lipidium medii is in the cruciferous family, so it kind of helps with the 2-hydroxylation. We're getting some really um, good feedback on this as far as um, some of the really quick, within a month of the mastalgia, some of the symptomatology, 
and waiting for more and more research to come through. We're very pleased with the research that we've seen on those individual constituents. How is Estraquench used? Basically, um, it can decrease breast cancer risk um, for people. It can be used in breast cancer therapy. A lot of people are asking me, and they're starting to use that, and I'm just showing them, well, here's what the papers say. These herbs are also anti proliferative and on and on and on, and some of them are feeling quite comfortable with that. Um, and um, men can use it, obviously, to protect the prostate. Of interest, years ago, um, the NIH, you know, the National Institute of Health, you were talking about the government, on its website actually said, you know, one of the things that causes prostate cancer is, is estrogen. It's like, wow, you know, it seems like they were talking about that before anyone else was, which is really interesting. So, you know, part of uh, the prostate cancer or uh, prostatitis uh, therapy is to calm down the estrogen production. And then all these things we can do to control excess testosterone therapy uh, is what estrogen is designed for. The protocol is very clear. You know, if someone needs their uh, estrogen knocked down, start on estrogen. If, um, if I want to be even a little more aggressive, I, I'll start them on DIM Enhanced. Uh, this Douglas Lab says, I like the DIM Enhanced because as well as having the DIM, it also has a number of the other herbs that ha have other um, uh, help with estrogen metabolism by different mechanisms. And I've really seen that that it does a much better job at chewing up estrogen than, than using plain DIM or or indole 3 carbonyl so I've become a real, I, I didn't design that one, um, the, the uh, team there at um, Douglas Labs did, but it's one of the most impressive formulas I've seen as far as really uh, catabolizing estrogen very quickly. Um, test again, also if you try, you know, that works great with estrogen. quench. You have an andropause male, give them estrogen quench and test again and, um, and everyone's a lot happier, okay. Fibrocystic breast disease, as well as giving the estrogen quench and the DIM, and I use the same protocol also kind of, uh, very closely for the, um, you'll see for as a breast cancer adjuvant, you know, I would, I would really try to, really try to 2-hydroxylate the estrogens that were left and then I want to methylate them because as you know, 2-methoxy estrogens are literally anti-cancer. You know, our body makes its own chemotherapy if you give the right stuff. So I would give lots of DIM. In fact, I'd give twice this dose. That's what the label says, but I would give more than that, actually. I'd methylate, and I'd give them Wobenzyme to also help with the inflammation cytokines and stop the inflammation, the, the fibrotic tissue that has already been forming in these breasts. And um, if they start to get hot flashes and night sweats because we've chewed up the estrogen so aggressively, we can give them estermen because estermen does not give them estrogen. It's not going to cause fibrocystic breasts. In fact, if you recall, it is anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative properties. So again, if you're going into a woman and, and aggressively knocking down her, um, I'm sorry, I was putting this slide on picture. If you're aggressively knocking down her estrogen with ester quench to quit making it, you're chewing it up with DIM, you're methylating it to make the 2-methoxy estrogens with anti-cancer, and then we're, you know, if they have hot flashes and night sweats as part of that picture, then they can use estermen because, as I mentioned, the estermen is antiproliferative. And the Wolbenzyme helps get, um, is used as an adjuvant in all types of different cancer papers. If you haven't read any of those papers, it's really fascinating how um, that's where I first came across the word adjuvant so many times is because they kept talking about Wolbenzyme being an adjuvant in chemotherapies and cardiac therapies and anti-infective therapies, on and on and on. So what if there's too much of a good thing? Okay, we talked about testosterone a few minutes ago. What if a woman has too much testosterone? as in PCOS, some forms of PMS, PMDD, and menopause. And with the symptoms are quite clear. We, we're really familiar with this concept, the increased facial hair, body hair. At the same time, the, the male pad, the um, androgenic alopecia, the loss of scalp hair, the acne, the oily skin. The nervous system is agitated in women that have too much testosterone. Uh, they had increased for breast cancer and ovarian dysfunction, increases for high triglycerides and diabetes and prediabetes and sleep disorders. So high testosterone in women with PCOS is, is a real problem, you know. This is really interesting because like I said in the early 90s, you know, everyone talked about, you know, women don't have testosterone except for a few women that have PCOS. Now I recognize everyone does. And at least 10%, some papers say much higher than that. I hope that those papers are wrong because our polycystic ovary syndrome is, is very difficult on the, fe on the cells of the females. Um, as far as causing, um, you know, the agitation of all the different systems here, including some resistance, et cetera. So one of my goals was is trying to say, okay, I want to get rid of the androgens right away. So I put together an anti-androgen formulation. Now this is where you see peony again, okay? 
Uh, Peonia, as I showed you earlier, also can help um, the body make progesterone. Um, but it has, so that's one of the main reasons why I have it here. It has mild antiandrogenic properties. I'm going to be honest with you, it's not really strong, but it still counts, so I still list it there. Some of the herbs are very strong antiandrogen, as we understand, is um, of interesting the um, um, Osseum Sanctum, which is holy basil. Some people use that in adrenal adaptogen formulations, but the funny thing is, is that it will also knock out your testosterone. That's why it's called holy basil. You just you know, you want to sit and meditate because you have, your testosterone has been knocked out. You have no mood, motivation, drive. Vitex agnus cast is also called monk's pepper because it knocks out testosterone at the right dose. So we have all these herbs that will knock out testosterone. Other herbs have actually been shown to actually be um, testosterone receptor antagonists. They'll bind to the receptor and they'll block it so the testosterone can get there. Because inflammation is pretty much ubiquitous part of the high testosterone picture, we're very pleased to see that all these herbs have um, anti-inflammatory properties and antioxidant. We know that trigonella does quite a bit of stuff. It's a really good anti-glycemic uh, formulation. You know, I know fenugreek has its virtue for anti-glycemia formulations, and I see it used to control blood sugar, but I have to remind people that it's also an anti-androgen. So I like to use formulations, anti-glucose formulations that have trigonella fenugreek, uh, fenugreek in women, but in men, I don't like to give fenugreek because it, it can be an anti-androgen, as I just mentioned. So, of course, you know, why we knock out, why we lower the testosterone, we don't want to induce testosterone deficiency symptoms, neurocognitive dysfunction. So these plants independently have that. And the high testosterone is very inflammatory, as I said. And so the fact that these have an, an analgesic properties is also a wonderful bonus for these patients as well. It's primarily used in the menopause types that have high testosterone. If you can picture the charts, 3, 6, 9, 12, now that you have it memorized. Um, there's many forms of PMS, PMDD that have angina excess disorders. As I mentioned, that little four, the chart of the four, the lower right-hand corner of that had that. And of course, PCOS and PCO-like syndrome. Remember, the PCO-like syndrome is a phrase being used for the patient that does not have the, the phenotype, doesn't have the physical presentation. You know, they don't have the abdominal obesity, they don't have the, the um, uh, fat pad on the back um, below the uh, shoulder blades that you'll see in severe PCOS patients. They don't have the hirsutism, the acne, the thin of the hair. They can look totally like they have no problem with testosterone, but biochemically they're full of um, polycysts and their androgens are high and they're pre-diabetic and, and it's interesting. I've seen a, a number of those. So just because a woman walks inside and, and you go to say, I can tell by looking at you, you're not PCOS. You may be wrong. There's quite a few women that do not look anything like PCOS, and they're really full-blown biochemical PCOS. So that's the PCO-like syndrome. Keep that in mind because um, there's a lot more of them out there than we realized years ago. Here's the antiandrogen protocol. As I said, it, it's, it's actively uh, up there now, and as new information comes out, we'll we'll continue to tweak it. One of the things we found out, as well as these women with PCOS needing test to quench, many of them also wind up needing progesterone support, and a number of them actually need estrumend. Um, and Wobenzyme is really a very, very kind thing to do for these women. It really helps with a lot of the inflammation that the high testosterone is causing. And there's a very high comorbidity between PCOS and um, thyroid disease, as I mentioned. So see if that's indicated as well. You know, people go, well, why you give them all at once? Well, sometimes I'll just start with the number one. This is the best way to do these. Start with the one that's the strongest indicated, the test to quench, and then, you know, you know, ask them if she wants to wait in a month to six weeks and then reevaluate. You'll see it change that quick. Some people say, no, today I want it all fixed, and you can work with that. But I'm not adverse to seeing, you know, because once you, you know, start to control the tip of the spear, many times these secondary problems will, will correct themselves. So that's one thing to uh, keep in mind as well. Uh, again, premenstrual patterns, that, um, a number of them actually have um, need anti androgen therapies. Um, there's quite a large population of women that are not full blown PCOS, but are on that scale. It's not either you are or you're not, it's a scale from you know, different shades of, um, of androgen excess out there. The different menopause types. Again, in the 90s, it was, um, it was heretical to say that all women aren't the same. And everyone's given one size fits all, and here I was actually given herbs to block testosterone when some women didn't even know they had it. But now we recognize that as a given standard now. Here it is um, quite a few years later, um, treat each woman according to her own menopause type. Um, and 
I think I did PCLX Simulate. Did that? Oh, that's. Oh, I did. I'm sorry, they almost PMS. This PCOS, same thing here. PCOS, test equipment, et cetera. I think I put in a double slide here. But that's available for you there. Androgen excess in men is pretty quick, actually. The bottom line is when men have too much testosterone, they have prostate problems. We're going to try and knock out their testosterone forever. I do have some men that have in post prostate cancer. They may stay in long term anti androgen therapy if they're concerned about metastases and those type of things, and that's fine. But most of the men I've worked with, it's to go inside and uh, even with um, bacterial prostatitis, it helps sometimes to just like, you know, stop the stimulation to the prostate, let it shrink up, clean it up, and then, you know, you know, restore things, okay? So many times this is a temporary measure is to control the anti-androgens with our test quench. This is a pretty powerful formula. You take this and it's going to knock down your testosterone and um, I had to use it in young men, like I said, with prostatitis, and it's been very effective, and they, they can tell the testosterone has been flatlined out pretty quickly, but then once we get rid of the chronic prostate infection stuff, we let the testosterone come back. That's a good thing about these. A lot of these herbs, you know, they, you know, they have been documented that within two weeks after quitting, then the testosterone will come back. The idea is to stop not only making testosterone, but also to, you know, block the receptors, um, quit making the DHT. Um, you know, some of them have been, actually been documented as causing significant androgen deprivation, one of them being Osim Sanctum again. Again, I do not like Osim Sanctum in fatigue formulas. <laughs> um, Anti-inflammatory, um, three have been documented to this point in time as being anti-proliferative. I expected more from my experience. I expect the serenoa reagents to be documented as well, but hopefully someone will actually document that um, through some type of study. And they have other properties as well that, you know, secondary that help with um, the high testosterone in men. So that may be people with mild prostate swelling who want to kind of calm down while they have time to detoxify. And you remember, many times you'll see a gentleman with some, you know, mild prostatitis, he may actually need the estoquench as well. So get the estoquench and the testoquench, let the tissues calm back down, and then you can wean them off the testoquench. And, you know, once the tissues are restored, um, again, I have a number of patients that are on long term, but there's nothing wrong with using it just to fix the problem and then, you know, get the wove enzyme inside to clean up the mess and clean the diet up, etc. Um, benign BHT, it helps with that. Uh, proliferative disorders and um, um, because it actually has androgen receptor blocking properties, it actually has been used in, by some clinicians for um, proliferative um, conditions. And here's a, um, a brief, you know, Hyperplasia, it's basically the same thing I'm going to show you in the prostate cancer. I don't know why I'm showing the same rule twice here. But, you know, you can use testoquench and estoquench if needed, as I said, to really quit stimulate the prostate. The prostate is stimulated by estrogen as much as testosterone. Uh, if you want to get real aggressive, I'll use DIM and, and the B12 to, you know, do the estrogen thing the same as I would with the breast or other cancers, Wobenzyme. And then if you want to um, stop the angiogenesis and metastases, um, I'm sure you're often with the research on uh, Pecosol and it's able to be able to help with that. So those are some things to consider specifically for uh, testosterone therapy. So what we've talked about here so far is we've talked about eight different hormone-specific formulations that you have available to you now. And at the very beginning we said, you know, when a lot of patients come to us with fatigue disorders, the vast majority of them are going to do better with and uh, adrenamend and or thiramend. Some of them have a very strong thiramend picture, especially after you do the risk evaluation like I just showed you, you know, family risk factors and other risk factors, and you go, wow, yours is most, let's do the thiramend first. Other ones, you may have a mixed picture, and to give both, um, pretty much universally, if someone's on a weight loss program, they're going to plateau. Um, you give these two formulations together, and that kind of, you know, gets them back into um, gets all the systems back online that we talk about is very beneficial for that. We've talked about how, as well as dealing with fatigue disorders in women and, and metabolic stuff in those two formulas, you can customize either the PMS or the PMDD or the PCOS for each woman depending upon what her specific needs are. Again, you know, the one size fits all is like so passe. I mean, we're not doing that like we were back in the 90s. You know, we don't have a pill for a problem. We have multiple formulations here that you can customize the dosage on. Now, on these labels, you probably recognize it's very unique labels. It says start with two, then increase to four, then decrease down to two. 
you know, we call that the 242 protocol, and this is the first line of products, probably the, well, the only one now that has 242 protocol, because that reflects traditional herbalism. When I, you know, in traditional herbalism, I start a patient on a little bit of an herb, I'd watch the response, and, you know, they do the same in China, and Ayurvedic, all the medicine, give them a little bit, and then you look for the response, okay, let's give you the full dose. Okay, let's fix it up. And then here's what I say to the patient the first visit. When you come back to me after one to two months and you say these magic words, I feel great, do I still need to take four a day? My answer is, well, apparently not. You know, it's, it's done what it's supposed to do, so let's kind of wean you down, which is what they've been doing for thousands of years, to the lower dose and see how that works it. As I mentioned, that woman on progestamine, she now was, she was down to like one a day until recently she had to increase it back up to two because she's starting to go through the perimenopause at this point in time. But the objective here is, we can customize by mixing the formulations, but also the different dosages. It really um, allows us to practice herbalism at its best. You know, we have these herbs clustered into the pigs that they are. In men's health, we can either help them raise their testosterone, and many times those same men will also need ester quench. Uh, as I mentioned, over 40 of age and over 20 pounds. Um, those two, were, um, they may need to quench as well. Some may need test to quench to calm down and, and rescue the prostate. And many times I've found that I use to quench with that to get really aggressive, shrink the prostate back down, detoxify all the detoxification protocols you use, do the um, um, woven enzyme, et cetera, and then we can allow them to come off it if it's just a temporary B9 or, a temp or prostatitis situation there. Um, again, you have the whole formulation of how these different um, formulation we work together, mix and match based upon the patient's needs. But before we close down, I want to go over a few more quick things here. Again, let's keep in mind here that we're dealing with multiple systems here. To really look back and reevaluate Han Selzé's work from over half a century ago, he did talk about multiple systems that are being affected by stress. Yes, the adrenal cortex is right here in the middle, you know, with the gray outline here, but he also talked about the medulla and all the other systems that are involved as far as um, uh, etc., uh, the stress response. And at the same token, we, we, we've seen his work be, re, be proven by MacArthur and by McEwen and some of the other studies I mentioned last time. We talked about the allostatic load. It's a multiple system uh, uh, um, is being affected by stress. But we are right, you know, it, it's okay to talk about, you know, the concept of adrenal fatigue because as you know, they're the first ones in. The adrenal glands are the first ones to respond, I mean, immediately to stress because the HP axis and the um, sympathetic adrenal system. So we're going to have the cortisol, the DHEA, and all the other hormones get dumped right away, and the epinephrine and norepinephrine. But at the same time, we're going to have all these secondary systems get involved. As I mentioned, the thyroid, you know, in acute stress may actually come up a little higher, but it's going to get burned out. You know, and again, keep in mind that not only do we dump in cortisol and DHA during the alarm stages, but also progesterone. It's not unusual to see high progesterone levels during acute stages of stress as well. And so, um, you know, that's an, an interesting thing to observe a few times. And someone just asked me about that recently. Why don't have high progesterone? Well, you know, let's see what else. Oh, they're going through a crisis right now. Well, that's, you know, they're in the alarm stage. But, you know, obviously all the other systems have to be affected as well. So our goal then always is to modulate all the different um, homeostasis regulatory systems. And Adrenamem was designed to do all of that, but if, if you go back and look at the other formulations, you probably notice that a lot of them have like secondary benefits as well. Like you notice that, you know, the test sequence for women also have, I also mentioned dysglycemia as well. Most of them I talked about the inflammation, so the neuroendocrine immune system. You know, so in a number of them, we actually had thyroid support as well. So they're very specific as far as what they do, but, you know, the reality is that they still work together and they do overlap a little bit, but they, so you can, you can target the thyroid or the estrogen or testosterone, et cetera, but the same token is we can give some secondary support as well. I think you have a, hopefully you have a good understanding of how these formations came to be. They came to be, first of all, out of the observation in the 90s that, that we need to really personalize women's health care and get rid of the um, what I used to call herbal prempro, where they shove every herb inside, you know, give it women all the estrogen, progesterone, and any herb they can. And some women did not need those. They don't need um, those. They just need 
maybe just test again. Some of them actually test the quint as we're seeing now. So that's what it was designed to do is to make you um, help you personalize the care you give here. And um, I think we're actually going to close with that. We have time for questions. I'm talking about an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. Again, Nutrisearch is going to be a good resource for you, and, and, and I'm always in touch with them. So if you have any questions, they'll want to buy them, and um, someone probably asked the same question. And, we'll, and um, if they don't have the answer right away, we'll work together to help you. Any questions at this time? Hello. Dr. Collins, I'm here. Thank you. Yes. Very much. Sorry. 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 No, nope, no worries. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we do have questions that came in. We do have some time to answer Good. questions. Um, let's see here. We have well, not quite a few questions on thyromen, so I'll go ahead and start there. Um, okay, let me, um, okay. Um, first question, is there a test for reverse T3, and if so, is it qualitative? Yes, there is a test reverse T3. Uh, it's a blood test, as you would expect. It 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 is um, it's a it, it will it is it's quantitative. It's a, you know is it, is what you're asking. It will actually tell you the amount of um, um, reverse T3 that a patient has. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I've, I've used the test a number of times. You know, it's an expensive test, and you have to kind of but um, it's used more and more now in the states, and you probably start to see it used more. But you can actually measure um, T3 and reverse T3, and then you do the ratio analysis, you, you know, mathematically. And as you know over there, you, you, you work with pica moles, you work with the, you know, the metric unit. Over here they use gravimetric testing, which is a nuisance because you have to, you cannot do ratio analysis gravimetrically because the molecules weigh differently. You want to compare the number of molecules to the number. So use your, um, you know, your, your metric system. The, the pica moles and animals, whatever, and then do the ratio analysis as you would anything, and you'll be able to really quantify a, a person is um, if the reverse T3 is, is through the roof, like I've seen in a number of patients. And yes, we are able to reverse it with thyromend. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And can we use thyromend for conditions that the um, patient may be kind of going back and forth between hypo and hyperthyroid? One of my, um, you know, the one of the things that we say in medicine, as you understand, is first do no harm. If a patient is still in a state of Graves' disease, is what you talk about here, then, then my primary focus is on um, arresting the inflammation, the autoimmune disease. So with them, I'll be very aggressive with, um, with Wobenzyme, get them off of the gluten, uh, do anything else that can calm the system. A number of them I actually wound up using progestomen, believe it or not, because uh, Buplan Romani, as many of you know, have anti-autoimmune disease properties as well, and so progestamend, you know, just as progesterone is anti-autoimmune, progestamend mimics those properties. So of course it's you know it's easy to get the women to take it. The guys I had to convince them that you know it didn't it wasn't because they had PMS, but progestamend as or any any therapy that you would do to control autoimmune disease, uh, I would do that. One thing is. As you know, if a person's in an acute stage of hyperthyroidism, excessive thyroid, then you can use L-carnitine, not acetyl L-carnitine, but L-carnitine. L-carnitine in two gram dosages, go ahead and look it up, uh, will actually, um, it's thyroid receptor, it, it blocks thyroid um, uh, function. It, it's great when I've had some of the, the really hot graze patients come in, I'll use that to buy myself some time while I let the Wobenzyme and other things um, calm down the autoimmune disease, but if the person is going, I, I, um, if they if they're too hot, I don't want to use thiamine until I get rid of the fire. Okay. Okay. Yo, yes, and and NutraSearch wanted me to remind everybody that um, they do offer a thyroid hormone testing panel with NutraPath Labs, which will measure the RT3 along with the TSH, the T4, the T3, and the three antibodies. So I did want to mention that. And yeah, you know, and I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad that we knew that antibodies are being tested regularly because I see that problem here in the states where people get the T3 and T4 measured and they say, well, what does this mean? And I say, well, it means that the test is incomplete because unless we're looking at antibodies, we have no idea whether your thyroid is being attacked and stuff. So that sounds like an excellent panel. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I order. Great. The whole thing. <laughs> Absolutely. And is thyromin, um, would, do you think it would be contraindicated with pregnancy, or do you have any another suggestion if someone needed to take 
<laughs> I know that's a trick. I'm, as you know, I, I'm real conservative pregnancy. It's not my area of expertise, so I, I defer pregnancy and lactation to um, herbalists that specialize in pregnancy and lactation. But what I will say is have some rosemary and sage, okay, because um, use the herbs that we know are safe colonate herbs. So I have encouraged some people to, um, um, you know, they can, you know, use parts of the formulation, like if they want to use some rosemary and sage. And as you know, um, you know, um, so pregnancy is one of those high-risk areas of, um, you know, of initiating thyroid disease. So good core nutrition is going to be part of that. A lot of antioxidants. A lot of it's caused by oxidative stress. That the thyroid is very sensitive to oxidative stress and radiation. So, yeah, but I, I don't recommend for pregnancy lactation. That um, some people have a great gift in that. So, okay. Fine. <laughs> yep, I'm sure that NutriSearch can help you find someone there that has um, some of those things. <laughs> right, exactly. And we have a question on how the thyromen would compare to taking a whole thyroid gland, maybe perhaps armor thyroid, which is a porcine gland. Do you have any comments on that? Well, the thyromen is, is designed to restore hormone therapy, and that's what we're using it for. And I've actually gotten people off of porcine thyroid and off of, you know, levothyroxine and triadine because of the same thing. So th whole thyroid glandulars is thyroid replacement. You're giving T3 and T4 from a, you know, a porcine. It's, it's like from an animal. And you're also giving these, you know, foreign thyroid globulins. You're giving porcine thyroid globulins and you know there's still debate whether what, what that's going to do to people but the, so and what's interesting is many people that come to me are on thyroid replacement therapy such as armor thyroid such as other thyroid glandular brands or prescription thyroid and they still have the clinical hypothyroid picture because you know it's only the first um, few steps that are important you remember uh, the first three steps of thyroid make the thyroid the other steps are making the thyroid activated, well, that actually happens with uh, armor as well. The other steps are getting the thyroid inside the cell. The papers that talk about thyroid hormone resistance are not saying that these people need thyroid hormone. They're saying that they have thyroid hormone, but it's not getting inside the cell. That's what thyroid is different than, than any type of um, thyroid replacement, whether it be porcine, armor, or other types, is that the herbs actually help the thyroid hormone get inside your brain cells, your fat cells, your muscle cells, your bone, your bone cells, and make it work. You know. Now, if you want to be conservative, you know, take some rosemary and sage first, because maybe that's all they need is to have that doorway opened up. And I really like it when patients can, you know, learn to self-care with some rosemary and sage. And I've had a few that that's all they need. I'll be honest with you. You know, and I say, great, just do that. You know, other ones we've had to go the full step and help with the DNA and the RNA and all those other steps. So hormone replacement therapy is is not the end of it all. That's why these formulations were made because I had so many people on thyroid medication, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and they were still miserable because it's not just the hormone, just the tissue response, which is what we in herbalists know is that's what herbs do. They help the body respond to cell signaling better. Great. Thank you so much. And do you think progestomend in using it in an estrogen dominant woman would perhaps increase menstrual bleeding? Using progestomend in an estrogen dominant woman. Okay, now if by estrogen dominant you actually mean that she has excessive estrogen, the proper medical term, then you know, then the, the way to treat that would be estroquench. Okay, um, what I've found with with progestomend with dysmenorrhea's, whether it be metrorrhagia or menometrorrhagia with you know having the excessive bleeding and the episodic bleeding is that progesterone is very beneficial for restoring the normal monthly cycle but here's how it works is is it's like I told you have to take progesterone every day of the month so the mistake that some people think is they, they is 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 you know this is not like hormone replacement therapy or the pill where you just take progesterone the second half of the cycle because you know a woman has a uterus every day of the cycle and every day we want to restore normal function of the uterine tissue so what we do is when a woman has metrorrhagia, menorrhagia, any of those excessive bleedings, um, giving progesterone every day of the month will normalize the monthly cycle. 
and it's because it's you know follicular you know mid cycle luteal is all corrected so I hope that kind of answered it in a way if a woman has too much estrogen and you want to get a progesterone mend up have her take progesterone mend and we're getting rid of the horrible um, dysmenorrhages uh, but if she has true estrogen dominance if you measure her estrogen and she's making way too much um, then you can use ester quench to actually lower her estrogen. Okay, great. Thank you for the clar clarification. And we are out of time for questions. So if you did not get to your question answered, please contact NutraSearch and they can be directly in contact with Dr. Collins. And I want to remind everyone that a recording of this webinar as well as part one will be available through NutraSearch in the next couple of days. And to download a copy of hormone specific formulations, and clinical protocols, you can visit yourhormones.com as well as douglaslabs.com. So I want to thank you, Dr. Collins, for your time today. We really appreciate all the information that you provided to us. And we want to thank all of our listeners as well for spending your time with us. And I, I wish everyone well. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Goodbye.